Sorry, I have to admit more people here. Still admitting people. So good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah? yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for being present at this first webinar of this 22-23 webinar series of the, of the European chapter. It is my pleasure to have here today King Jong opening this series with a very stimulating topic, the integration of experimental methods in the study of therapist effects. So I will start with just a very, very brief presentation of Kim. I'm sure everybody knows it, but anyway, uh, just a very brief presentation. Kim is Assistant Professor of Clinical Psychology at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, and she also has a private practice. Among many other awards, she won the Outstanding Early Career Achievement Award from SPR in 2018. And Kim works with data sets of considerable uh, sizes to address uh, several main issues, mainly personalized mental health care and therapist effects in routine outcome monitoring, but also deliberate practice and training therapeutic skills. So I'm pretty sure we'll have a very stimulating uh, presentation and discussion today. And I'm very, I would like to thank you, Kim, for being available to, to start this series. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Miguel, for that kind introduction. <clears throat> so um, maybe I can start with just sharing my screen. It's good to see some familiar faces in the participant list uh, to see your videos. Um, am I allowed to share a screen? Yes, I think so, right? Um, okay, looks good. Can everybody see it? Some thumbs? Yes, I see people nodding, that's good. <laughs> All right, so... Um, I think right now you should also have the, you also uh, see it full screen. Um, that's good. Okay, so let me start by um, saying that actually today I will not be talking about results of research. Um, and maybe that's a bit odd for a research talk, um, but I really wanted to, to share with you kind of the way of thinking that I have around this topic of integrating experimental designs in the study of therapist effects. And so it's more of a methodological talk than it is a results talk. Um, the reason why I chose to do it like this is that I think it's kind of a newish topic for a lot of people in psychotherapy research to use these experimental designs. And I've noticed that um, people usually find it quite helpful to kind of hear about it, sort of how do you get the idea, how do you then shape um, uh, such an experiment, rather than going to a lot of results, which would allow me to talk less about sort of the design of the studies. So I, I decided to focus um, on the designs more than on the outcomes. And so the only thing I can say is that if you were really hoping for outcomes, come to SPR in Dublin, because I will probably be talking about outcomes there, <laughs> but uh, not today. Um, so that was kind of a precursor and maybe um, managing uh, the expectations of the audience a little bit um, uh, here before I start talking. So um, maybe um, as a quick introduction of how I got to do this kind of, kind of research is that I started out as a sort of more applied researcher, uh, very much coming from the clinical side, as Miguel was already mentioning. Um, but when I started working in Leiden University nine years ago, there was kind of a unique situation where here in the Netherlands, routine outcome monitoring had gotten a very bad reputation. And in that period, um, it was quite hard to do research on outcome monitoring in this country. And so all the contacts that I had were kind of saying like, oh, well, right now is not the best time to do research. And so that in a way forced me to also start thinking about different possibilities and different ways to do research. 
And um, I happen to be working in a department with a lot of experimental psychopathology researchers. And so, you know, I saw their presentations, had already seen them for quite a while. And I was like, well, that actually may offer us new pathways of looking into things like psychotherapy research um, and maybe integrate sort of the two fields together. And that's basically how I started my journey in um, uh, experimental design. And I can really say that it is a journey because it is a steep learning curve. Uh, as some of you may know, when you enter kind of a new uh, methodological area, you have to really uh, get into that and you will also make mistakes. And I'm actually going to share some of those mistakes with you as well today. All right, so I'm going to very briefly talk to you about the background of therapist effects. It's just one slide. I'm sure everybody already knows this, <laughs> but uh, what we know is that actually, um, you know, there are um, differences between therapists in how well they do with patients and what their outcomes are. And so um, there have been excellent studies that have shown um, that even though the differences of five to nine percent of the variance that explains is explained by therapist differences um, does actually have big imp a big impact on how an individual client is being treated. And if we look, for example, for, at the graph that I didn't um, reference, but it is from uh, Saxon and Barkham, um, we see that a below average therapy therapist actually um, uh, has much less chance of getting treatment success with their clients than an above average therapist. And that, that difference is quite big. First, 46% versus 77% is quite a stark difference um, that if we look at 5 to 9% variance, doesn't feel quite in the same range, but it is. And we also know that if we look at the extremes, that the best therapist can obtain up to four times as, as good results or better results than the 10% on the bottom. Um, so that's just the extremes, of course, um, but, but still. So this is probably not new to you. Um, for those of you who uh, go to SPR, they've heard talks of this, this, this along these lines. Um, now, what we when we go to what explains therapist effects, then we know a lot less already, because we do know that, um, yeah, client characteristics matter, um, for example, specifically the severity. Uh, we now know a little bit about therapist characteristics as well. So things like interpersonal skills um, that matter or things like um, sorry, intrapersonal skills um, like reflective functioning, professional self-doubt are um, variables that are, you know, sometimes found to be predictive, sometimes not. Interpersonal skills is one of the better predictors that we have that is sort of more stable over time. Um, uh, there's been more multiple studies from multiple groups, so we have a little bit more confidence that this is something that matters. And then, of course, there's also kind of the interaction between the client and the therapist that a lot of people in SPR do research on, um, which is uh, responsiveness and alliance and, and things like that. Now, um, when it comes to therapist effects, there, uh, there, there are multiple uh, important questions. And uh, not all questions can uh, be answered uh, with naturalistic research, I think. And that's why I think also um, experimental research comes into play. Um, so when we're looking at what is the relationship between therapist characteristics and client outcomes, I think we can imagine that we can study this in a naturalistic setting where we look at the characteristics of therapists. Um, and their clients' outcomes. But when we're talking about a question about what is the mechanism behind this relationship, so how does that work? And, um, you know, is that something that we can also influence? Um, that's the last, the third question. Then I think um, experimental uh, designs give us the opportunity to um, study this in a kind of a unique way, because of course we know in uh, experimental research, we have the possibility to also manipulate certain things. And then we are a bit more certain that um, that factor may actually be causing 
uh, something in our outcomes. And so that's why I think it's specifically attractive um, to think about these types of designs. Now, of course, there's different types of experiments. I'll breeze through this a little bit, but I think the presentation is being shared and probably you can then look over the slides again, but I'll just go through this quite quickly. So there is things that are sort of really lab experiments or field experiments and natural experiments. And so mostly what is important in lab experiments that it is in a controlled environment and that there is manipulation of the independent variable. Um, and they're easy to replicate, have strong internal validity, and you can prove the causal relationship, but it also has limited ecological validity. There may be experimental effects and demand characteristics at play. So that are, those are kind of downsides of it. If we look at field experiments, the difference is that they are, they are being conducted in the natural environment, um, but there is still manipulation of the IV, um, the independent variable. Um, the limitation here is that you would have um, uh, less control over potential confounders compared to a lab situation, for example. And then if we look at um, natural experiments, then we are looking at a natural environment, but also with the independent variable occurring naturally in life. So that has um, clear advantages for the ecological validity. Um, and it can also be used in situations in which manipulation would be unethical. But the other, the downside is that you have no control over potential confounders uh, and that you can also not prove uh, a causal relationship. And that sometimes it's also more expensive than lab studies. Although this also depends on what kind of, you know, um, um, tests you use, because lab tests can also be quite expensive sometimes. <clears throat> Um, when we're looking at experimental studies, there are some, uh, some elements that are good to discuss because I'm going to get back to them later. Um, so often uh, an experiment uh, that is more lab based or kind of a field study with lab elements in it uh, has a baseline, especially if you use physiological data. Um, it, people are individually quite different. Um, and um, <clears throat> so uh, we always compare data from individuals to themselves. So um, uh, everything that we use in labs uh, is usually baseline corrected when we're talking about things like physiology and things like that. So we need a baseline where people are calm and um, sort of relaxed. <laughs> And we need kind of a period that is long enough to establish what is sort of their natural state in rest. And then we compare their responses in the experiment to the baseline so that we know how much more tense or how much more stressed they were compared to the baseline. And, it, and then that's the, the step after that is that you then compare potential conditions with each other. Um, so just keep in mind that all these things that we're going to talk about uh, when we're talking about measures, they are all baseline corrected, um, just so, so that you know. Um, then we have a manipulation usually, and then after the manipulation, you want to check if the manipulation actually worked. And so that's a manipulation check. It can be done in various ways, um, but I will also give examples from that. And then you have an, an outcome within the experiment. Um, and sometimes if you're lucky, you also have external outcomes that are outside of the experiment. And I will share that as well. But for example, in one of my studies, we were lucky to test therapists with mobile apps in their work environment, but with a, a, um, a kind of lab paradigm. So they were doing an experiment and we've got their outcomes on the experiment, but we also have their treatment outcomes. So then you can kind of connect their performance on the test with their external treatment outcomes. So that's an example of a study where we have both the outcome within the experiment and an external outcome. Now, when we're talking about the types of measures, um, and we're talking about um, um, kind of what, what kind of data we collect, there are several types of data that 
uh, you can use. I mean, this is not an extensive overview, but this, these are some of the measures that I have been using um, in the kind of work that I do. So um, I don't know how much people know about heart rate variability, but heart rate variability is an indication of um, arousal. And um, the idea is that the heart starts to beat more regularly when people are stressed. So the variability naturally in rest is larger than the variability under stress. So the heart beat usually goes up, so it goes faster, but it also becomes more regular. So, and, and it's a difficult concept in a way, but um, basically the variance goes down or the standard deviation goes down, you can say that, of the time between uh, the peaks. And you can see that here, this is the milliseconds from one peak to the next peak. And then if that becomes sort of more regular with less variance, then uh, people are usually more stressed or more aroused. Now with eye tracking, you can kind of um, monitor specifically, I mean, there are multiple things that you can do with eye tracking, but what I've been doing mostly was eye gazing. And eye gazing is um, basically, um, and, uh, you know, kind of an indication of you choose an area of interest on the screen and you look at how often compared to the entire time that you are recording a participant or you're recording a certain response, um, is the participant actually looking at the area of interest versus looking outside of it. So one study that we're now setting up, but we're interested in seeing um, uh, showing uh, the videos of difficult, uh, challenging therapy situations of, uh, to um, trainees. And then we want to know how often do they look at the face of the client in the video versus the time that they look outside of the face. And we think maybe um, there's actually already previous uh, work um, from a different area of psychology that suggests that specifically trait empathy is associated with looking at faces in the videos. So if you, we are going to test if our participants, if they spend more time looking at the face in the video, if they also have a higher score on the facilitative interpersonal skills task uh, that was designed by Anderson that I'm going to talk about more in more detail uh, later on. Now, skin conductance, I think most people know that um, the, um, the conductance of the, of the skin goes up when people are nervous because you start to sweat a little bit more. So then electricity is uh, conducted in a better way um, when um, you're nervous. And so you can see here that these um, responses usually first go up and then they go down. And so this is basically the skin conductor's response. It's about how quickly does it drop again? And uh, so you usually calculate with the, uh, the milliseconds of uh, how long sort of these, these uh, like the amperes um, that are used um, to uh, uh, the, the kind of the area under the curve kind of uh, analysis is it. <clears throat> now, something that's more recent is acoustic data. So these are measures of the voice. Um, we, uh, for example, record people's responses uh, to these challenging therapy situations, for example. And then um, what we can uh, measure is um, the, what is something that's called the F null, which is something like pitch. And we know that if people are more tense, that their uh, vocal cords are actually also more tense. So there's more, uh, um, more stress in the body, more tense muscles. And that causes people to have a higher pitch and also to, speak, to start to speak faster. Um, so those are two of the potential uh, characteristics that we can uh, have a look at uh, when we're collecting data on this. And of course, we can all think about when we see that people are nervous, that they start to speak really quickly and things like that. I think a lot of people can uh, imagine um, how that happens. Um, and then, of course, we have something that is um, observational data. I think people are quite familiar with that in psychotherapy research. 
Um, and uh, in this, in, in my research that has been mainly on the facilitative interpersonal skills, where we rate people's interpersonal skills according to the FIS manual by uh, Anderson. And, um, but of course there's other ways. Um, there's definitely other behaviors that you can uh, also quote uh, when you uh, uh, are watching either live or you, in our case, we usually use video recordings. Um, and then of course the traditional way um, uh, in our field that is used a lot, but we also use it in the lab um, is uh, self-report. Um, it's a bit different in the sense that we usually don't do a lot of uh, longer questionnaires, but you often use fast skills from like zero to a hundred, for example, to immediately measure after something that you do, uh, how somebody is feeling, but also sometimes to check what is the concentration level, how difficult was this for the, for the participant, things like that, that can actually also be used as uh, manipulation control uh, questions. So maybe, I don't know if that's the intention, but I've given a lot of information here. So I was just wondering if there are questions and people want to ask them now, that's also okay. If somebody has a brief explanatory question. Don't make me raise your hand if you do. Okay, well, it's, it looks like it's not the case. All right, let's continue then. Okay, so um, there are also different research designs um, and I, I spe specifically wanna um, say something about uh, between person within person and crossover designs. And I will give you some examples as well from my own uh, research. Um, well, an observational design is I think sort of relatively um, straightforward. Um, you would have a baseline, you would have an experimental task, you would have the different trials, and you would just um, uh, yeah, measure. So observational design does not mean that we're just observing, but you would just measure that and you only have one condition. So you would just kind of, you know, kind of exploratory design where you look into um, what um, uh, what happens when people take, take this task. So now within each trial, usually there are different components. And in this particular trial, we were looking into uh, the facilitative interpersonal skills. Um, if we, um, <clears throat> we would then have first case information. So people would get some information about the clients and which session it was that they were seeing a fragment from, et cetera. Then they would view the video. They would respond to the video. And that's basically all recorded. But then the period that we're interested in particularly is the response to the video. And that is something, the, the sort of the, the period in your data that you're interested in is called an APOG in experimental research. And so I don't even know where that name comes from, but I know that I had to learn this <laughs> to communicate with our lab technicians and everything. Um, so it's a useful term to know. And then that was followed by a rating of distress, um, concentration, and um, um, difficulty. Now, within that period of the response, so in this particular case, in the FIS task, um, people are viewing a video of a challenging therapy situation and are then asked to respond to the video as if they are the therapist of the client in the video. So it ends with a cue that says, now is your time to talk. And so that's the moment when our period of interest, our April starts. So the moment the therapist starts to talk, we can rate the quality of their response and of their interpersonal skills with the observation ratings, with the FIS manual, we can use the period from when they start talking to when they click to the next, Thing to answer uh, their, just, uh, their ratings, uh, to, um, to uh, me measure their HRV, their uh, skin conductance. And for that same period, we also calculate what their average pitch is and what their speech rate is for that particular period. So that's kind of the idea 
of um, yeah, how you use the APOC so that for each of those measures, you have exactly the same period that we're talking about. And that means that you can also then relate them to each other potentially. Now, if we're looking at the between person design, I think this is what everybody knows. This is the traditional, you've got a baseline period, then you randomize people to either the control group or the experimental group. This is very much like RCTs, et cetera. And then you just get an outcome. Now, within, uh, within person crossover design, um, you randomize people to a phase rather than or an order. And in this particular case, we would have a control group and then an experimental and control condition, experimental condition, or they would be randomized to experimental condition first and then control group first. And I'll show an example where we didn't do this crossover design and it really influenced our results. Um, because of course the order in which you present something can really uh, influence uh, people's responses. And uh, so that can sometimes be quite a challenge. When I started out with doing this research, um, we didn't think of doing that crossover. <laughs> and so uh, we ended up with data that in hindsight um, uh, was uh, kind of a, a bit flawed because of that. Um, because in the second study, we did actually do the crossover and we found very different results, uh, almost the opposite actually. So, um, that is, I think, quite interesting uh, to, to kind of know and think about. Now, why do we do the crossover design? To control for order effects, indeed. Um, and because, in the, um, because we, uh, we want to make sure that it is really the exposure to the experimental condition that is doing or causing something rather than um, that they just got something in a specific order. OK. So now I'm gonna give you more concrete examples from my own research. And as Miguel was already saying, um, some of my research was uh, on routine outcome monitoring, but also uh, within routine outcome monitoring, um, some of you may know that I also was looking at differences between therapists in how they could deal with routine outcome monitoring. And one of the things that we found in, um, <clears throat> in one of our RCTs was that, um, therapists who um, had um, a higher prevention focus, this is part of the regulatory focus, um, which means that they had a higher tendency to avoid failures. Um, they uh, had less positive results when they were getting feedback from the room on their patient's progress. So I, I don't know if people still follow because <laughs> those were a lot of variables. Um, but the idea is that there was a difference between therapists um, who, um, um, uh, who I think maybe this is, no, this is not it. Okay, so um, there was a difference between therapists who were more focused on avoiding failures than therapists who were focusing on achieving success. Now, regulatory focus is a bit of a difficult construct, um, but um, uh, it has both a chronic and a momentary factor. And we all have both um, of those modes or those foci in us. It's just that for some people or for some moments, one of those is stronger than the other. Now, what's interesting here is that regulatory focus is actually a concept from social psychology, and they had actually already developed several ways to manipulate that in experimental research. So we could basically just borrow one of their paradigms, adapt it to the kind of situation that we are in, and, um, and use that to study maybe this in more detail. So what makes so I wanted to know why. Why are um, people who are more focused on um, obtaining success uh, better able to deal with feedback than people um, who are more focused on avoiding failure? Um, so uh, I'm just gonna skip through this real quick. 
So we wanted to pilot that in the lab and we used um, 23 trainee therapists. So they were actually bachelor students. So, I mean, it's maybe a little bit of a stretch <laughs> to call them trainees, but um, so they were third year bachelor students, but they did take um, the, all the clinical courses that were mandatory already. So they were kind of in the last phase of their bachelor and um, uh, they were um, um, told that we wanted to try out a new teaching method and that we um, uh, wanted them to uh, then uh, sort of participate in this experiment. So um, because of course it may influence how uh, they respond, we didn't want to tell them the actual reason for the study because that may have influenced uh, their choices and their, their um, and yeah, their things. So in this case, we started with measuring heart rate variability and skin conductance. And we used a two by two with in-person crossover design <laughs> with uh, positive and negative feedback. So we had four cases for each and we had an induction of regulatory focus. Um, so four cases of, cases of promotion focus and four that were in the prevention condition. And we had randomization of blocks, case order and feedback within each block. So you can see kind of an example here. We had the baseline then we induced the regulatory focus. So this could be either the prevention or the promotion focus. And then we had the different cases. And then for each case, they would um, get uh, positive or negative feedback. And then that was also randomized. Um, and then after they had finished that one um, a block of all the, say, prevention cases, they would then move on to the promotion focused uh, condition and get all the cases there. Now, the way that um, regulatory focus is usually induced is that there has been a lot of research um, that shows that um, uh, prevention focus is really um, associated with people's sense of responsibility. So with a focus on uh, responsibilities, whereas promotion is, well, for example, focuses, for example, linked to things like creativity, uh, to kind of ideals and uh, bigger goals. And so, um, one way to induce this, and this is how they do it in social psychology, is to have people write about and think about um, uh, their responsibilities versus um, their uh, higher goals and motivations and hopes and dreams, etc. So here we induce this by how do you think um, a treatment all to go, what things would you like to prevent from happening in therapy whereas with the main in inductions. And then it goes to kind of like, uh, what is your personal motivation to become a therapist and what do you hope to achieve was in the promotion focus. Now we did end up putting in repeaters because this is not a very strong um, induction. Um, so in each case, we also use promotion words and prevention words where we um, uh, told people what that can reinforce that, um, that initial induction. <clears throat> so here you see an example. We had an audio fragment of two minutes. There was a picture of a client with a neutral expression. And then we had a treatment message. And it depended on the condition. So in this case, we have a prevention example. You want to prevent that your client deteriorates. You hope to obtain the best outcomes for your client is the promotion focused uh, example. And so we try to keep these as closely as possible, uh, kind of saying the same thing, but then with different words. Then we had people choose from three um, interventions. All of them evidence-based interventions, so there's no right answer. This is important because if you give negative feedback, um, uh, you want to make sure that, that, that it's not an actual right or wrong in this situation because we are manipulating the feedback. And then we also ask people to what extent they thought that the intervention would be helpful uh, to, for the client. And this is kind of an investment in their answer kind of check. Um, and it turned out to be an interesting variable. 
So then we gave them feedback, uh, and what we said it was going to be the expected treatment trajectory for the treatment that they chose for this particular client. So we told them a little bit of a story of like personalization and how each choice for this particular client with specific characteristics would have an expected outcome trajectory and some trajectories would be better than others. Now, in this particular case, there was an increase of severity. And so this was actually a negative um, effect. Um, so this was negative feedback, similar to how you would get negative feedback in Rome. And then they would assess, we would assess their mood. And so, as I said, I'm not going to talk about the outcomes of the study, but what I do want to show you is um, we asked them then what they thought was the credibility of the cases and if they agreed with the feedback and what the credibility of the feedback was. And what we saw was that they liked the cases, they thought they were quite credible. On average, they got an eight out of 10. They didn't always agree with the feedback, so six and a half, but what was really problematic in this design was the credibility of the feedback. They didn't really didn't believe the feedback. And so in a second round, um, uh, no, first say this. Okay, so uh, no one really guessed the manipulation that we used, but some, some people had different he had ideas about maybe we were interested in their response to negative information. So they did guess uh, in part um, um, uh, that, that it was had to do something about you know, how they respond to uh, these kind of graphs. Um, and what was interesting that, in, in fact, we could predict from personality features of the participants if they found the feedback credible. It's kind of an interesting one because um, uh, I think this has parallels with uh, therapists in uh, real life with um, who do not always believe uh, the information from Rome. Um, and uh, it's interesting that these things can be predicted. Um, okay. So um what we also checked is was 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 there actually a difference in affect um when people received negative feedback versus positive feedback and this was a significant difference although you can also see that the negative affect wasn't too high it was only 35 on a scale of uh, zero to 100 um, but it at least you do see that there was a successful manipulation of negative versus positive feedback in the sense that they did feel differently after negative feedback. I'm going to skip through this. Um, what we thought was, well, this paradigm might be useful to study feedback effects, but um, the low credibility is, de is definitely a problem. So we went into a second round where we tried to improve the protocol. And so what we did is we tried to first improve the mock rationale. So we said it was about clinical intuition. So, um, and that we were, we made the um, treatment selection kind of um, thing more explicit. And we said, we want to compare your clinical intuition to the algorithms, so thus making it a bit more personal for the participant, because that was the other thing. There was no nothing personal at stake in the previous design, whereas here we're saying, well, we're judging you. We're judging how well your clinical intuition is compared to these experimental, scientifically validated, etc., cetera, um, uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, we also made the feedback message much more clear, and we used the between subjects design, which is a little easier to, um, to analyze, and we used a larger sample size of 100 participants. Now, this is what they watched. This is a video of a um, uh, satellite floating through space. It's really boring. This is what we use for a baseline uh, for the physiological measures. Then they get the introduction to the structure of the experiment, they get the cover story, and then the, the scenarios are explained and the feedback types are explained. And then we have uh, Professor uh, Wolfgang Lutz, who we recorded an explanation of personalized mental health and how certain characteristics of the patients can really determine that they do better um, with this treatment, treatment A versus treatment B. So this is also to uh, enhance the, the um, believability and credibility of the feedback um, and the idea that we're doing. So this is the same, um, and this is also quite similar. So I'm just going through that. 
Um, we also added more interventions, uh, so that it would be even more difficult to get it right. Um, so uh, it more unpredictable, which is an advantage in this uh, particular example. We also made the feedback more clear. So we had large, sem large uh, numbers. We made it more intuitive by saying well-being, and if the score goes down, it's bad. And it's in red, and it says no progress. <laughs> and so that's uh, that's how we um, enhance sort of the, the way of um, of uh, looking at that. And then um, we have a visual analog scale. So now, if we're looking at the manipulation check, the credibility of the cases was still high. Um, the agreement on the fee feedback was about the same, but we can see that in this case, the credibility of the feedback did really uh, in, uh, enhance. Um, so uh, that is kind of a rotation, I think, how you go through different experiments and then try to improve your paradigm and to get at some point to something that you can actually use. The downside of this is it's a steep learning curve. Uh, it does take a lot of time and effort um, to kind of shape your paradigm in such a way that you can uh, use it um, in uh, future studies uh, with more confidence. Um, but you can also see that the information from a manipulation check is really important um, to take into account. Okay, now I'm just gonna, I'm actually almost out of time. So I'm gonna really focus maybe on one more thing. Um, so I already talked about the FIST task earlier. And um, so one of the things that um, I just want to, and then I'm going to stop, but I'm going to share a few more slides, is um, uh, one thing that we did was with the FIST task, we had the challenging therapy situations. And from the work of um, Saxon and Barkham, we knew that um, therapist effects are more pronounced in more uh, severe cases. And I was wondering if maybe something about the challenging nature of the FIST clips um, made it that they found such a predictive effect. So I was wondering, well, what if we compare them with clips that are less challenging, that we ended up labeling them B9? Um, and um, so we actually took them from the same session as the challenging clips were originally developed from, and they were emotionally activated, but there was not an interpersonal challenge for the therapists. So the FIS clips, they're really um, about stuff like, um, you know, a direct address to the therapist of like an alliance rupture. And in this particular situations, we chose to not have alliance ruptures, but have um, patients talk about um, uh, things that they uh, encountered in their daily life with other people. So it's still an interpersonal situation. For example, somebody goes to the bookstore and they get really annoyed that the salesperson is not paying attention to them. And then they talk to the therapist about how it really annoyed them that this, this person who is working in the bookstore uh, wasn't paying attention and that they got really angry with them because of that. And so that's kind of a situation that is not really directed at the therapist. And in, in that sense, is less challenging uh, for the therapist. So then we had a situation where we had benign versus complex. And this is the study that I was talking about where we didn't do a crossover design because we just wanted to see if it worked or not. And we had a fixed order of benign first and complex later. And um, the, the second study that we did, we did do a crossover and we saw actually that um, that really influenced the results. Um, uh, so, uh, it was not a good idea to not do the crossover here because um, we definitely had order effects here. People had a lot of time to practice with seven cases and then they were doing a lot better in the complex situation compared to uh, 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 in the crossover design. We saw that actually people did find the complex situations more, the challenging situations more difficult um, uh, to use their interpersonal skills. Uh, whereas in this design, we didn't find that, but I think that's because they had time to practice with the seven uh, benign cases first. So again, within each case, we have the audio vignette, viewing of the video, response to the video, and their distress ratings. And um, we had a sample of 45 trainees. These are master students who already took their basic therapeutic skills and um, basic um, cognitive um, uh, behavioral therapy intervention courses, and they also had some interviewing courses. 
and um, we rated them on the uh, FIS. And then we wanted to know, of course, whether pe people perceived the challenging cases to be more difficult than the benign cases. And that was indeed the case. We did find a significant difference there. And also important, we did not find a difference in concentration. And this is especially important because we had the, the, the challenging clip seconds that if they their concentration levels drop over the course of the experiment, then that could be the reason why they would potentially underperform, for example, in the second condition. So that was good. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, and then we wanted to see uh, whether these things um, had uh, an influence. So um, maybe one thing <laughs> to show you, just to give you an idea of how this looks. So here is, for example, the self-reported distress. And you can see the different trials. So here in the benign therapy, uh, the, the mind, look, benign cases, they started out with higher uh, distress levels and the distress levels dropped. This is what we call habituation. And then when they started the complex um, situation, we see that the stress levels, uh, the distress levels increase, and then they also drop, but at a slower rate in the complex condition than in the benign condition. So this is an interaction effect. And just to give you an idea of how this would look for the physiological measures, we see something quite similar. Just remember that this is baseline corrected, um, as I said in the beginning. So in the benign condition, first you see an increase compared to baseline. So baseline is zero. And so we see an increase in stress compared to baseline. Then people habituate during the experiment over the seven trials that are part of the benign condition. Then there is an increase in stress, a slight increase in stress um, when they start the challenging condition. But what we also see is that actually during their response, um, it doesn't really further habituate. So they don't uh, go down in distress in their physiological response on skin conductors for this particular uh, um, situation. So we see that there are to some extent the effects are similar, but also a little bit different. And the idea is, I think, that we can then integrate these different types of information on self-report, the physiological measures, measures from the voice, etc., and integrate that into a total, um, you know, the same situation, but with different sources of information and see if they converge or not, and what that can teach us about how people respond to these challenging or non-challenging therapy situations. And then, of course, that can give us hypothesis for maybe some future research that is more in the field um, where we have less control, but maybe we can test specific hypotheses based on the things that we find in these lab studies. And I'm going to slide now through everything. And then this is sort of ending. <laughs> um, so my top tips for if you want to do something like this, research in this area, is to definitely first collaborate with people who have experience because it's a very, very steep learning curve, I can say uh, personally. Um, and also expect as your first experiments are your learning fees to so basically learn how to do this. Um, and maybe you can't even publish on that. Um, that it's very important to have a clear operationalization. Don't make it too complicated. Um, also consider which measures are most appropriate for the type of uh, experiment that you're doing. And um, yeah, stay close to what you measure in your interpretation. So um, I know that sometimes these physiological responses are in interpreted as emotional responses. But we don't know for sure if that's the case. So there's a lot of discussion in, in the field of uh, psychology about what it is that we're measuring with these physiological measures. Um, but I think for me personally, what has been kind of really the fun part is that with these experiments, it's both a combination of rigor. So you have to be quite rigorous in how you design these things. But you also have to be really creative. And to me, that's a lot of fun. And I think it gives us different type of information than we are getting with traditional psychotherapy research. And this is why I am personally very excited about doing things like this. And that's my end point here.
Thank you so much, Kim, for this stimulating presentation. Uh, we have some time for questions. I would suggest that people write or raise their hands in the in the Zoom uh, if they want to ask any question or simply write on the chat and we can see the question there. Let me start with the curiosity because you said that uh, you were able to predict uh, uh, from the personality of the therapist, the credibility checks, but you didn't, you didn't, as you are not presenting a lot of results, you didn't say what were the personality uh, traits that uh, were involved in this. Can, can you share something on this? Because I was really- Yeah, curious. yeah, for sure. So we, we, we measured, um, so this is, it's a little while ago that I looked into this. So it, it, I'm just going to take um, a little bit of, um, I think that this is it, but I, I might be wrong. Um, but what we definitely assessed here was um, self-efficacy of the therapist. And um, so how much confidence do they have in their own um, uh, abilities as a therapist? And that influenced um, also their, uh, their ratings. Um, and I know that there was one other, but I can't remember right now. I mean, this is a study that we con that I conducted, I think, eight years ago. So I don't know the exact details anymore okay. of, uh, of yeah. that uh, particular uh, prediction. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, let me check. We have no questions in the chat at this point. I don't know if I can see. So was I exceptionally clear or are people just now really puzzled and thinking like, oh, what can I ask? <laughs> we have a lot of ask, I think. Okay. There's a question Hi, here. Yeah, I, I can thank you for uh, presenting this. It's very, um, um, well, be creative. Well, it's nice to hear. Um, the question is, uh, do... Um, uh, therapists do they like those uh, sorts of studies are they interested in themselves can you do you have a lot of problems uh, uh, getting uh, therapists to, to do well, well to be in your lab and uh, do these yeah. um, uh, well, that, experiments a, with you yeah. it's a very good question because as you know I'm coming from ROM research and therapists do not really like to be studied in that kind of context I know <laughs> um and much to my surprise and pleasure, they love this type of research. Um, they want to participate. Now, I do say we come to them. So we bring a mobile lab. We go to location. If we have three or more uh, people and one location that we can measure on a day, then we go there, we test them. And uh, so it's a low kind of threshold for them. Um, and we did arrange for them to be able to do it in work time, which is also, I think, something that helps. But um, there was also another factor that was kind of influencing how many people in a certain location would want to participate. And that was whether their team leader was participating in the study or not. So we saw that if their team leader participated, then we had a lot higher response rate in uh, those uh, section in those teams than when the team leader said, "Oh, I'm too busy," and but I really think you should do it. <laughs> so I think it's also about maybe um, for them to first of all, I think, show that they find it important, but also be willing to also be vulnerable, because I think this is the type of research where. Yeah, you know that you're being judged on your abilities as a therapist. And so I think by giving off the message, I'm willing to do that as a team leader, it shows to other therapists like, you know, if this is a safe environment in which we can do this. And they're very curious about the results. So it's, I, I like it a lot that therapists are quite enthusiastic about this, line, this type of stuff. Yeah, it's good to know. Thank you. See if there are some other questions.
So don't feel um, like you can't ask very basic questions, by the way, because I mean, if, if also if it's very practical stuff, feel free to ask, because uh, I noticed for a lot of people, this is kind of a new thing. I had to ask a lot of what I thought could be perceived as silly questions to my colleagues, uh, but I couldn't have done this type of research without that. So do feel free to just ask. Michael, Michael has questions. Hi, uh, thank, thanks, Kim. Okay, now you've given me permission to ask a basic question. I feel okay. Um, but I, I've, I've been struggling with this sort of tension, you know, that in psychotherapy research sort of can go in waves. We, we get caught up on particular things, you know, for example, like ROM or like personalization and stuff like that. Um, and so I'm kind of tackling the kind of issue of we, we have sort of flavors of the month in one level, but as sort of scientists, we also like or espouse to hard data, which of course is exactly the route that you're, you're talking about. Um, but sort of one sort of combination of those at the moment is all the kind of digital kind of kit that people are applying and stuff like that. I mean, do, do you think that that's, is, is that, am I thinking about this in the right way that, is there a way forward to, for using this kind of paradigm in some ways, more in line with the digital kind of, yeah. kind of framework, rather than perhaps what I've been thinking about is rather the old fashioned sort of things yes, that you stick uh, on your fingers and stuff like that absolutely um there's a lot of developments that i didn't talk about but i am aware of and, and experimenting with so the study that i was talking about earlier where we're interested in whether people look at the face of the video versus um uh, outside of the face for, for gazing, um, there's new technology, for example, with web gazing, where you use participants' own um, video of their own laptop or computer um, to measure whether they're looking at the face or not. And right now we're comparing that in the lab to the infrared eye tracker to see if the results are, you know, if we're not losing too much information, but we would gain a lot of access to therapist all over the world, uh, basically, if we are able to do this uh, via online uh, uh, experiments, for example. Um, and similarly, I think there's a lot of work done in um, using video data and measuring heart rate variability, for example, from the forehead in videos. So apparently, if your video quality is high enough, you can get kind of a pulse or something uh, from the coloring of the video and this is still at this moment not quite accurate <laughs> compared to uh, an actual uh, heart rate uh, measurement um, but there's definitely things moving in that direction specifically combined with the use of machine learning similarly for uh, determining in voice, for example, like when somebody's speaking, so you don't have to do a lot of manual work for, uh, you know, creating an APOG and things like that um, in more naturalistic settings. So some of these techniques uh, are now extended, I think, into an area where you can use it on naturalistic data. So that's one aspect. And also, um, the experiments are also, I think, especially as a result of COVID pandemic, etc. The the movement towards doing a lot of these things online has also uh, begun, and uh, we see that actually um, the accuracy of these measures we do lose a little bit of accuracy, but we gain so much access basically, uh, and uh, and that's definitely something that's happening. Right. Thanks, Kim. It's a great presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any other question? Uh, yes, I would like to ask a question, please. Um, so uh, in the important questions in the beginning, you mentioned uh, it is important to know whether therapist variables are modifiable. So I just thought, is it possible in the first place to conduct such an experiment with a variable that is not modifiable? What do you think about that? Um, 
Well, I mean, I think whether it's modifiable or not is probably the empirical question that you want to answer. Um, uh, but um, obviously, if something is really not modifiable, then you can manipulate all you want, but uh, <laughs> you will not get a difference between the two conditions. And, and what is tricky, I think, then is that you will not know if it is because you have a failed manipulation or whether this is really not something that can be modified. Um, but usually, I think you would run pilots and stuff like that to see if you are able to successfully manipulate a certain variable before you run it in like a larger experiment. Um, so we often start with maybe 20 participants, we test it out, we see if there is anything happening at all before we roll it out in a bigger, uh, bigger sample. Okay, so that's a question you have to ask in the first place. Yeah, but then, of course, the second question is then how, and then that, that's also, so for example, right now we're working on an experiment where we're trying to do brief instructions on, um, this is in collaboration also with Tim Anderson um, and a uh, colleague of his, um, Matt Perlman, and um, so we are, a uh, student of mine and I are looking into, if we give a very brief training like a 90 minute training do students get better in empathy for example mm -hmm. and so uh, we give them a brief training and then we test them again and see if they have enhanced um, on uh, their performance on their face task for example so that's another way of approaching that um, and these are then sort of relatively brief experiments where we get an idea of whether it is at all you know moving or not uh, the empathy scores Interesting, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so perhaps you're done. Thank you so I much. I think we're done. It is time, so. <laughs> Thank you so much for this presentation. We are looking forward to seeing the results in, in Dublin of these studies. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And thank you for having me. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.